A lot of people think we're crazy. A lot of people think that we're nuts to even take on what we have here. Everything with pregnancy has been phenomenal. This has probably been my best pregnancy thus far, as far as how I feel. I'm moving every day. I don't feel stiff at the end of the day. And when I do eat grains, it just, it makes my back hurt. It makes my joints hurt. And when I eliminate them, I find that I don't have those issues. And health-wise, everything looks phenomenal on my end. So my husband actually hates vegetables. It got to the point where he's like, I don't want to eat this. I'm forcing myself to eat it because I have to make my kids eat it. And I'm miserable. And when we found out about carnivore and animal based, we were just like, what's the point in laboring over this garden and weeding every day and putting all this time into planting and stuff like that, if it's not even necessary? Okay. Good morning, everybody. It's good to be back. You guys know I just got back from the UK. This is my first day back. They lost my luggage again. <laughs> they lost it on the way out there and they lost it on the way back. But today we have, Sh Shanna is going to give us her story, I guess, today. Shanna, welcome. How are you doing today? Doing well. How are you, Dr. Baker? Like I said, just got back in from out of town. I slept like a baby last night because I hadn't slept. And I don't sleep on these international flights. Worked out pretty well for me. Where are you located, by the way? We are over in central Pennsylvania, just north of State College, where Penn State's located. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Awesome. I guess let's just get started here. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you, what you, how you grew up and stuff like that, and what happened to you and where you're at now. Yeah, absolutely. So born and raised in Portland, Oregon. Fortunately for me, it was a little bit different when I was there. Ended up going to Washington State for a year after high school. Did a stint with ROTC and athletic training there, and then decided that I wanted to enlist in the military rather than go the officer route. Enlisted in the Marine Corps for five years, worked on C-130s while I was in, and then got out, got my degree in athletic training, sports medicine, started working as an athletic trainer here in the area. I went to Penn State, so it made it easy to just stay here rather than going back west. and then. Yeah, I got my master's in sport and exercise psychology. We moved into the home that we're in now, which is situated on about 24 acres or so. And we are, I would consider us full-time workers and homesteaders. So I'm working virtually as a coach, as well as mothering full-time and homesteading full-time. So it's a three-part job that I have right now, but it's keeps us busy. And yeah, it's never boring. Yeah. I can imagine that it's going to keep you busy. I just got a question for you. You said you were in the Marine Corps, right? And you're yes. working on C-130s. And I guess, cause I was wondering, cause C-130s, I thought they were an Air Force, Air yeah, Force so, craft. So how did that work? Yeah. So the Marines, we actually have J's, but I did my schooling. I got to go to Pensacola, Florida first. And then I went to an Air Force base for almost a year in Little Rock, Arkansas. And that's where I learned how to work on C-130s. And then the Marine Corps C-130 community is pretty small, tight knit. And obviously they don't go in ships and things like that. So yeah, it's a nice community. I really enjoyed working as a mechanic there, but my passion lies in health and wellness and nutrition. Yeah, I guess you're pretty handy around if you're homesteading. I don't know if you got any heavy machinery equipment or like a tractor or something like that. You probably fix some of that stuff too, I imagine. But anyway, so yeah. how? So tell me, you sound like you're pretty athletic. I can tell looking at you, you look like you're athletic, and obviously you're doing the athletic, athletic training. Did you work with the wrestlers, the football players? I'm, you know, I'm wondering what you do with the Penn State guys. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, I've been athletic all my life. Actually, started as a young a young child. I was a figure skater played soccer, ran track, did a little bit of everything. Once once I got older and got into the athletic training gig, yes, Penn State was awesome because I did get to work with the football players and the wrestlers. Those were two of my favorite rotations. Working with those the gymnast athletes like that are just phenomenal. It was really inspiring to work with them as well as eye-opening to see what they do for a living, as well as being students and then working with professionals yeah, so after that. It's a lot of hard work. <laughs> There's a lot of hard work behind the back it's for being able to perform at a high level. But so just 
Was there some sort of health crisis that you had to overcome at some point? Or tell me about that if it occurred. So I have, like I said, always been active, have never had any health crises in my own life. My family in general is very unhealthy. Obviously, just growing up, I had grandparents who had cancer and diabetes, of course, and heart disease. I had uncles on my mother's side who all had heart attacks by the age of 50. My mother is overweight. She doesn't go to the doctor, so she doesn't really know if she has any underlying causes or conditions there. But yeah, I just grew up knowing that I needed to stay healthy because of my lineage. And so as I transferred out of the Marine Corps, my husband and I actually wanted to get into bodybuilding. We were very passionate about lifting, going to the gym, and we got into into the nutrition thing there. And then once we moved up here and I started going to Penn State, I took a few nutrition classes and I was like, wow, there's a lot going on here that I really never thought about. And then post-grad, I started researching on my own a lot. And my husband and I, that's our passion is just like doing our own research and trying to find out these things on our own and also putting in some of these practices into our own lives. And we slowly went from the bodybuilding nutrition to ketogenic diets to now we are mostly carnivore, animal-based And that's what we're leaning on the most right now. And that's what we have found to be the most successful for us. Yeah. And when you say bodybuilding, I know it's a lot of very high protein, typically often very low fat and I guess moderate carbohydrate. Was that kind of what you guys utilized back when you're bodybuilding? Yes, it was. That would be what I would call the epitome of a boring diet. My husband was looking to cut down. He wanted to be a bodybuilder. He wanted to compete in the 212 division. And I was just looking to probably do a women's physique at the time. But yeah, lots of chicken breast and tilapia, really just awful things that you have to heat up in the microwave for work and broccoli, lots of broccoli. It was gross. <laughs> yeah, I never, I can remember the first time I ran across broccoli as a kid. I thought, this is awful. And I, I never, I've never really liked it. I've had, you can make it somewhat palatable. I've had enough of it over my life, but never really got into that. And I did that, that similar diet for stages of my life. But yeah, it is, it's, it, it is pretty tough to do. Cause so uh, you have to take a lot of discipline. So you got to give your head, take the hats off to the bodybuilders who are able to do that. But it's not a particularly palatable or sustainable diet long-term for many people. And that's why they have an off season, which is very very long for a lot of them. No, you you got a family history of a lot of health issues and you got, how many kids did you say you had? So I am currently pregnant with my fourth child. I have three daughters and lucky, lucky for us and my husband, we're having a boy this time. So maybe you're done. I don't know. We'll see. You know, Possibly, got the, yes. Got the boy. So let me ask you as far as what prompted you to go from this lean, because there's a lot of people that are promoting this, it's a, it's a protein energy, satiety per calorie, lots of protein, very little energy diet to a ketogenic diet, and then eventually a mostly or fully carnivore diet. What, what prompted you to do that? Honestly, it was mostly my husband's doing, and I'm going to give him the credit for that because he... Like I said, he was trying to cut down to that 212 division for bodybuilding. And then we had a life event and didn't end up doing any competitions at all. But post training for bodybuilding competitions, he gained quite a bit of weight because we just went back to the standard American diet and he jumped up to about 260 pounds. Meanwhile, me, I've never been extremely overweight or underweight. I've always been an athletic build, but I knew in the back of my mind, we needed to change something because he was gaining weight and I felt like garbage, to be honest. I was always tired, poor circulation. I have in my family what's called a central tremor. And so my hands shake a lot and he would notice it and point it out. And so really it came down to him wanting to lose about 40 pounds and me wanting to set myself up for longevity. Then we made the change to keto. And then he started coming to me with these ideas of 
there's more than just a keto diet and keto can be great, but you have all these stupid snacks that we would buy the keto cookies and crap like that. And it just turned into maybe we could just clean it up a little bit more and being now homesteaders, maybe we can just grow our own food, raise our own livestock. And so that's kind of where it came from is the sustainability of it and really optimizing the nutrition for us and our family. So your husband does a bodybuilding contest, gets down to 212, and then he puts on puts 40 pounds back on just eating regular food. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? So we never did compete. That was the issue. We had a huge thing happen where our house flooded down in North Carolina before we moved up here. And so we ended up pouring all our money into that house before we moved. And so we didn't have the opportunity to compete, but yeah, pretty much after we trained for it, he put on a bunch of weight and we were like, we need to do something. Like he was feeling like garbage. I was feeling like garbage that just, it wasn't working for us. So why not just go back to the chicken and broccoli diet? Was it, was that like no way? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was a no way. My husband actually hates vegetables, loathes them completely. And even Once we started our homesteading adventure, I tried to push the garden thing because I thought we needed it. I thought we needed vegetables in our lives. And it got to the point where he was like, I don't want to eat this. I'm forcing myself to eat it because I have to make my kids eat it and I'm miserable (laughs) with it. So we slowly started cutting out the greens. And when we found out about carnivore and animal based, we were just like, what's the point in laboring? over this garden and weeding every day and putting all this time into planting and stuff like that, if it's not even necessary. Fair enough. And so the decision you went keto. And so tell me how did that improve things for you a little bit? Did you notice like you felt better or what was it? What was the keto experience like? Yeah, absolutely. For him, he lost a lot of weight on keto. For me, I did feel better. The energy levels were a lot better with a higher fat diet. And I still continue to this day pushing a little bit more fat because it does make me feel better. But like I said, that there's so many, there's so many little twists and turns you can make with keto. And so we got into like keto style, but then it turned into like the dirty keto where we were just constantly buying quest bars and snacking and it's honestly, it's expensive for one. And after learning about seed oils and additives and chemicals and processing, it, it just wasn't worth it to me. And so that's where we came down the, this path where we're like, okay, meet basic things that are going to make your body perform optimally. We have meat, we have salt, we have, I like to eat dairy. He doesn't eat a lot of it. And then our girls do like fruit on occasion. Yeah. And you mentioned you were, he was cramming down vegetables despite he didn't, despite the fact that he didn't like them and he felt the kids needed to eat them. Is that something, are the kids still being required no. vegetables or are they asking, are they begging for vegetables or anything like that? Or what's going on with those guys? No, my, so my oldest does remember eating a lot of vegetables and she claims to still enjoy them. And we said, do you enjoy them or do you like the butter and the cheese sauce that we would put on your broccoli, that sort of thing? My middle child absolutely hates vegetables and she never did even like potatoes, like starchy vegetables. She did not like, and my youngest will not touch anything if it has anything green in it or on it. So even something with parsley or thyme or something with seasoning, a herb that we've put on something, she'll look at it and ask what the green stuff is. And she just turns her nose up to it. How old are your girls? Oldest is 10 and then five and three. Uh, okay. And as you, did you notice, in a, so you said keto, you were doing, obviously it can be very expensive. That's the thing particularly with all these processed food things with the keto label on it. I'm not even sure if you want to call it keto because I think it violates the premise of basically a whole food ketogenic diet, which can be quite effective for a lot of people. But it's like you said, it's so easy to read a label and it says, oh, it's keto. This is a cheesecake. This is a brownie, but it says, you don't seem to, you realize this is still 
food that we probably shouldn't be eating very much, but it's got a keto label so that it becomes absolved of any guilt, supposedly, but that's not the case. So you're on a, what made you decide to do homesteading? That's because not a lot of people opt for that. Yeah. So we, I graduated from Penn State. My husband got a job here with the the Fish and Boat Commission for the state. And so we decided to stay local. And one day he said, there's this property here. It's about 24 acres. And I came to look at it and I was like, absolutely not. It's a, it's a double wide on this property on this property. And he said, we could get chickens and I can hunt because it's mostly wooded. I said, okay, we'll consider it. So we moved into here. Um, we have a 10 year plan of staying here and we might stay here longer, but pretty much it started with the chickens, the laying hens. That's the easiest way to get into homesteading. That's like the gateway drug as they call them. We got a, you know, probably 10 or 12 of them. And then we started cleaning up the diet and we're like, wow, we're going to need more chickens. We're going to need more eggs. We started doing broiler chickens after that and turkey. And those were pretty easy to raise. And they started helping our pasture areas a lot with regeneration and they do a lot of fertilizing for us. And then this last year, we really decided to go hard and we got lambs and we have our own pork and we now have our own steer. We are slowly getting into, it's been a whirlwind. It was since 2018, so not super slow, but we are slowly regenerating our land, clearing out some of the wooded areas so that we can have a little more room for ruminants and then trying to transition to mostly ruminant animals in our diet and therefore raising mostly ruminants. Yeah, I was. I just got back from the UK and in, in, in what Eric called Lake District there and they had all, it was just beautiful. The land was just, they've been doing it the same way for a thousand years. The lambs had just come down from the, from it had just been born and it's the whole thousands of little lamb running around and cows in the field and some pigs and everything else. And he had geese at his house. And so we had some geese eggs, which were quite good to try, but yeah, so it's got to be really fun and neat to do. How much of your, how much of your diet are you able to produce yourself? Now, what percentage are you able to feed yourself at this point? Yeah. So we're about to, I would say as far as meat goes, 90% of what we're eating is our own. We have two big freezers in our garage and then a chest freezer in our bedroom, most of which is ours. So we do have a couple local farms around here. Fortunately for us, we have a lot of Amish farming in the area. And so we can go to them for certain things, specifically the dairy and stuff that we purchase. But yeah, we're about 90% right now. And that's mostly, at this point, it's mostly chicken, pork, turkey, and venison. And this coming month, we will be having our first steer butchered. So then we'll transition into having our own beef as well. And how many, in 24 acres, how many animals can you, do you think you can reasonably fit on that property when you get everything up to speed? Yeah. I mean, so as far as layers, laying hens, we have about 30 right now. When we get into the broilers, let's see, we have about 60 chicks right now that are slowly growing. They take about 11 to 12 weeks and we don't ornish crosses that most people do. We do what's called a freedom ranger. They're a hybrid here in PA that they're a little bit hardier and a little less removed from a real chicken. We have three, three pigs right now that are about 50, 60 pounds a piece. And then we have, oh man, our sheep. I think we have five sheep right now. That's including the lambs that were born this year, which is so much fun. And we have two steers and a dairy heifer that has not been bred yet. So she will be bred probably next year, early next year, so that we can start to produce our own dairy. Oh, that's good for you. And do you have any issue with predation? Any wolves, coyotes, bears, whatnot you have to worry about? We, so we haven't had anything until the last couple of weeks. We actually have new laying hens and chickens that we hatched ourselves this year. And they're in a separate run because we're going to go through and reduce the flock that we have right now and then put in some new ones. 
We think we got a raccoon that came in and got a few of them. And that's the first time we've ever had anything. So we set up a trail cam, of course, and we've been monitoring, but nothing. So we do electric netting around all of our pastured animals right now that we can move around and it's portable. And that's a pretty good deterrent for anything that's come out, I would imagine, because it's got a pretty strong bite to it. But yeah, just the one time with the chickens and that was really recent. So yeah, I'm curious because you said you're trying to regenerate the land. And so you know, I've talked to a lot of large scale regenerative ranchers and it's moving these large herds of animals from pasture to pasture, but on 24 acres, you're not going to have that. Do you have your bovines in, in, in a half acre area for one day and another half acre area in the next area? How do you do it with that? How do you regenerate? Yeah. So we have, right now we're using, like I said, the portable fencing. We move them every single day in the afternoons and we've got the two biggest steers and our ram sheep. He's with them for now. They go in the first paddock and then the smaller sheep and the, the dairy heifer are in the one behind them. So they pick up the scraps and they get a little bit of hay here and there because we're still working on really getting that dense grass growing in some areas. And then the pigs at this point are still a little small for our netting. And because we are worried a little bit about bears and things of that nature with pigs. So we have them in a static area at the moment. They go on what's called deep bedding. We just keep wood chips piled up pretty high in there so that it doesn't start to stink or get dirty or anything. But yeah, every once everything's in full swing, middle summer, everything gets moved every day. The pigs get ma- moved every week. And it's a lot of moving parts every day. What are you guys doing in wintertime? Because it's, it gets pretty cold and frosty in Pennsylvania in the winter. So I can't, there's probably not much grazing going on, I think. But what do you do then? Yeah. So we just built, we have the chicken coop obviously in a run for them. We've tried to keep them out, but there's just too much with the snow and everything. So they don't enjoy it. They won't leave the run if they have to go out in the snow. So they stay in a run during the winter, the bigger animals, the livestock, we keep them in a static area as well. We'll hay feed for them. And they have a couple of run-in shelters where they can out of the elements if they need to, but they have free choice there. So sometimes the steers, especially, they'll just stand out in the rain and the snow uh, <laughs> just because they want to. And it's we're not forcing them to be out in the snow, so they must enjoy it a little bit. Yeah, sure. And then I'm just wondering about the sheep. Are you using them for food? And if so, because a lot of people prefer lamb to mutton. And so I don't know what what age you bring, because a lot of people slaughter the lamb around, I think, around six months or something like that to get lamb and it's got a different flavor compared to things like mutton but how do you deal with the, how do you deal with the lambs and the sheep yeah so right now it's funny because my husband and i just talked about this last night he wants to transition to no sheep he's not i don't want the sheep anymore i just want cows he just wants to do beef because he prefers the beef over the lamb even though lamb is delicious but it's just they're so small We did butcher our first lamb last fall and he was about nine months. So he was in between that lamb and mutton stage and it was delicious. He's, he was an absolutely delicious lamb, but yeah, sheep in general are a lot more difficult than cows, which is surprising to me because cows get so big, the beef gets so big, but they're a lot easier to handle than sheep are. Sheep are flighty and they run all over the place and they get scared if you come near them. And we only have a couple that really come up to you and want to be pet, so to say. And so I think we might be actually selling our lambs and our ewes that we bred this year in hopes of purchasing a couple more steers. Yeah, have some people say the opposite. It's funny. I guess everybody has their own different experience with the different animals. Obviously sheep are not, you're less likely to get trampled by a sheep for sure. But at the same time, you can obviously can get more on a, on a, quite a bit more meat on a steer, but I know it's kind of like how much, how many sheep could you carry on the land versus how many cows and how much meat could you get out of them and so on and so forth. Going from bodybuilder to standard, a little bit of standard American diet stuff sounds like to keto to, to animal based or carnivore. How has that impacted y'all, your health, your family's health, your kids' health? Has there been any noticeable effects? 
Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We, like I said, my husband has lost weight. I feel more energized, especially on the more carnivore based diet. I don't have that afternoon crash, which is so nice to just get to 2 PM and not have to take a nap or feel like you're just dragging by the end of the day. Health-wise labs look amazing. And then our children, I really notice it when we do, especially with my middle daughter, when I do like a pre-K drop off in the morning or something like that. And you've got all these little five-year-olds running around going nuts. And all I can think is, oh, they had cereal or pop tarts for breakfast <laughs> and my daughter's just standing there patiently waiting to go inside and maybe it's a disciplinary thing or maybe it's part of her diet who knows but she had eggs and bacon this morning and she's not off the rails jumping off the walls type of thing so i truly believe it is beneficial for our health our children's health their growth everything is just it it feels like it's moving in the right direction yeah, no, and how are the kids dealing with all the animals? I'm sure they, I'm sure they're loving it. I would imagine. Do they like having all the animals running around? Oh yeah, of course. And when people come over, of course, that's the first thing they want to show them is, oh, here's our pigs and here's our chickens and let's go pet the cows and that sort of thing. So they really love it. Yeah, plus they get to learn quite a bit about just the way the world works and life and how your food, where our food comes from. So that's a a wonderful thing. Have you had any downsides? Obviously, I'm sure there's some downsides trying to raise your own food. It's got to be with some challenges in that. But with your health, has it generally been all positive? Has there been any negatives or any of the, or if you want to talk about some of the difficulties in producing your own food, perhaps? Downsides to the diet, I don't see any. I haven't really found any aside from every once in a while we'll have some ice cream because I, that's my vice. I really love ice cream. And if we do, we usually go out to get it. We'll make a night of it, but that's people talk about, Oh, what about the variety and things like that? And I don't really miss variety. I don't really miss the things that they say or eating the rainbow and things of that nature. I don't miss it. Health wise. I haven't seen any downsides. The downside of homesteading and raising your own food. It's a lot of work and it really puts things into perspective, especially when you have coworkers or somebody coming up to you and talking about how they just don't have time for anything. And I just, in the back of my mind, I'm just thinking, how do you not have time? We have three children, we have all these animals and we still find time to work out. I'm still working out three times a week, pregnant. We still have fi find time to do things with our children and to include them in the activities that we're doing outside. And so that that's, I don't know if it's any, it's not bitterness towards society or anything like that, but it's a lot of work. And when people complain about the time thing, that's really where I find my mind going is just wondering how they don't have time for anything. Yeah. I mean, it's when you, sometimes when you talk to people and you ask them what their favorite TV show is, and they can tell you all the TV shows or what, and you're like, wait, maybe you do have time. You can trade one of those <laughs> things, one of those activities in for something like that. Now you mentioned you, I think you alluded to the fact that you're, you tend to tr gravitate a little more higher fat. So is your diet, how are you getting your fats in? I mentioned, you, I think you mentioned you had some dairy. How do you typically like to get your fat in? Yeah, definitely the fattier cuts of meat, of course, if we're having burgers, really trying to get it in there as well. And then lamb is an excellent source of fat when you're eating it. We've grown duck as well duck is super fatty. And then if we have a leaner cut, my, my husband really enjoys sirloin from time to time. He likes the taste and the texture. We just put a slab of butter on it when it's done cooking. And then I do dairy. So I'll do heavy cream and things. If I make my own ice cream, obviously that's 90% fat and maybe a little bit of maple syrup, which of it's so nice here because we have friends that farm as well. They tap their own maple trees and they'll do their own maple syrup. So we get our maple syrup from them. And so we, it's nice knowing where everything's coming from, but definitely leaning on the heavy, the full fat dairy, if we are having something lean. Yeah, fair enough. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know in the news recently, I think there was 
Some Amish farm may have been in Pennsylvania, or maybe not. They were being shut down for, I don't know, selling raw milk or something like that. Is that an issue where with some of the people you – because, I mean, if, if you're just providing for yourself, they pretty much leave you alone, I think. But once you start selling it to the public, then there's all kinds of eyes on you, which is interesting in the U.K., I was asking about this in the UK and they don't seem to care. There's, you can slaughter and sell, slaughter your own stuff and sell it without all these regulations like we have in the US, which is an interesting thing. But have you run into any of that stuff? Yeah. So we, we get a lot of our ideas and things from Joel Salatin and he has that book. It's called Everything I Want to Do is Illegal. And that's pretty much going through all the, the bureaucratic things that you have to, the hoops you have to jump through and everything in Pennsylvania is much like that. I think there are certain things that you can get away with as Amish farmers because it it is more of their lifestyle, their religion, their beliefs. But when it comes to USDA certified and making sure everything has a label on it, the dairy industry is probably the hardest thing to get into. We know a couple farmers here who They sell their raw milk as not for human consumption (laughs) is what the label has to say. It has to say that it's for dogs and cats, something like that. But you know where it comes from and you see the cows every day and you know they're healthy and they're not walking around with mastitis and things like that. And so it is one of those things. And that's probably why we haven't put our homestead to use as a farmstead. We haven't really dabbled in the selling of things aside from like giving things to friends and stuff like that just because there's so much you have to go through to get certified just to be able to sell it yeah fair enough and oh, charlie was asking about processing your animals do you guys process them completely yourself you slaughter and butcher or on site at your house typically yes the only things that we don't have room to do right now are the steers. So they'll go to the butcher just purely because we do everything in our garage pretty much. And I don't, when we like hang deer or pork or anything like that, we hang from the rafters and we have to put down a tarp and kiddie pool type situation. The steers will be way too heavy for that. But yes, everything else, the chickens, the turkeys, the ducks, everything we, we do by hand here. Yeah, I was like I said, I was just in the UK visiting. I got to vi- visit the best rated butcher in the UK. Just, it was just voted. It was a friend of mine's son actually won that. And I was at in his little cold room where he was showing me how he butchers and had several animals hanging, including a steer or half a steer. So it does, it does take quite a bit of quite a bit of space and you gotta have the robust thing to do that. People that know you, like family members, and are they like your mom? You said your mom's in a what do they think about? you guys eating animal based and being homesteaders is anybody thinking you're crazy or what's the story on that yeah a lot of people think we're crazy a lot of people think that we're nuts to even take on what we have here my my mother they're all in portland still so my family's all on the west coast but they're coming to visit when the babies do and they love to come out here and see everything but it's one of those things where my parents are just like, you guys are always moving. You never sit down. You never just have a relaxed day. And it's not really, but are we supposed to? Are we really supposed to just lie around the couch potatoes? I don't really truly believe that. It might be different from what most people are doing, but I think it's I think it's right. Yeah, I guess when you have all those animals, do you have somebody like if you go out of town or can you go out of town? Because you know, if you got out of town, somebody's got to take care of those animals. Do you have a, some, a way to arrange that? We haven't taken a vacation out of town in, in a long time. I think the last one, we did go a couple days, like a long weekend type thing. And we were only a couple hours away. So we, since moving here and starting everything, we have not been out of town just I guess one of the sacrifices, if you want to call it that, of having a homestead. But to be honest, I I wouldn't trade it for anything. I I enjoy traveling, but I'm a homebody too. So I like to stay home and just stick to myself. Yeah, it makes you appreciate, you know, how much people that raise animals care about it. Because they they literally never take a vacation or almost never take vacation because they can't. And it's got to be something that you really enjoy to 
want to do that for sure. Do you find, of course, the question will be, well, you're eating all this saturated fat and cholesterol. How come you don't have a heart attack by now? I don't know how old you are, but I look quite young. But are you concerned? About, is, that a big, is that a major concern to you? No. <clears throat> like I said, it was a concern as I was growing up because it's something that's prevalent in my family. At this point, after a year or so of doing pretty strict carnivore, animal-based, I don't see that being an issue. My my lab number, the VA obviously makes us do our labs every year. My lab numbers are great. Everything with pregnancy has been phenomenal. This is this has probably been my best pregnancy thus far, as far as how I feel. I'm moving every day. I don't feel stiff at the end of the day. And that was a problem, especially with eating grains. And when I do eat grains, it just, it makes my back hurt. It makes my joints hurt. And when I eliminate them and I really focus in on the good proteins, I find that I don't have those issues. And like I said, health-wise, everything looks phenomenal on my end. So (laughs) it's working. And so this is your first sort of animal-based pregnancy and this is the best of the four you've had. How far along are you, by the way? Yeah, I'm almost 26 weeks, so oh, a little God, over so six months now. And yeah, I'm in the home stretch for well, sure. I can't, you can't tell from your shoulders up, you don't look pregnant. We can't see your belly, but you certainly don't yeah, look like it's, like some people get swollen and on the face and everything like that. It's good for yeah. you. There's another question Thanks. from Charlie. He was just asking about steer processing. Is it, do you have to get pretty good lead time to get a spot in there? Or do you have to, how far out is that in Pennsylvania or where you're at? Yeah, so it it is a big lead time if you do it the conventional way and you get a an appointment and everything with your butcher, especially since COVID. The butchers for they were affected by it a lot, unfortunately. But we have a farmer nearby who does his own steers and he's a little bit bigger than us, obviously. He's doing commercial dairy as well. So we know him pretty well and he's gonna fit ours in with his order, so to say. And so it's actually, it hasn't been bad for us in that respect. But if we didn't have that, it's about a year. Yeah. And you said how many, how many cows on the properties? I saw three or something like that, three or four. Yeah, we have three, three right now. The one steer will be due to butcher next month. The other will be next year. And I think we're going to try to, once we forego lambs and things of that nature. I think we're going to try to have an in-betweener, especially as our family grows. One one a year might not be quite enough. Yeah, sure. Fair enough. I can see that. And, you know, one of the, let me ask you just more about the diet now, because the bodybuilding diet, tough to sustain, it's, it's palatability is an issue. Obviously, you go back to the standard American diet, which is very easy to sustain, by the way. You can just sit there and eat junk all day and most yeah. people sustain that one quite well, but how do you find about this sort of animal based, based diet with regard to feeling satiated, appetite control regulation, not wanting all the other stuff that's out there? How does that work for you? Oh, it's amazing. So I, I used to be a habitual snacker and I would not leave the house without food in my purse or in my car. Something had to be in my possession because I would have an anxiety about going somewhere without food, without a snack, without a granola bar. Since transitioning into keto and now this carnivore animal base, it's it's amazing. Even as a pregnant woman, I can go for hours and not think about food. And I'll eat a meal, a large, everybody claims the ribeye steak is the best. And it really is. Like I can eat a steak and just feel satiated. I don't feel like I need anything more. I can go for hours and not feel that stupid hunger pang or in the back of my mind, just, oh, I need a snack. And it's truly, and we try to teach this to our children as well. Like we, we always will feed them a good breakfast and we'll tell them after you eat the eggs and the steak that we had this morning or the eggs and the sausage, you don't feel like you need to eat at 10 o'clock in the morning, at one o'clock in the afternoon, at three o'clock in the afternoon, you don't feel the need to do that. And it's just, it's been kind of life-changing because I don't, 
revolve my activities around having to stop for food or having to pack food. Yeah. When you got a lot of kids, it's a parenting hack. Load those kids up for breakfast, just slamming some eggs and some protein and maybe some dairy yeah. and just fill them up as much as they eat and just make sure they eat. And then you don't have to hear from <laughs> until maybe even dinner time sometimes. So it works out yeah. uh, pretty when you do. Otherwise you're constantly, particularly if you got one wants a food and then another one wants a food and you're all day long just and that. And then the problem is, so what do you do? You just give them snack food, cheap snack food is what has happened because yeah. we don't feed our kids appropriately and appropriate breakfasts more than anything, I think, in, in, in a lot of ways. Do you, how are your kids growing, by the way, on, on this homestead? Because you hear a lot about farm kids being big and strong and are your girls yeah. look like they're doing okay? Yeah, I would say my oldest is the tall and slender type. She grew really fast and she still continues to grow fast, but they're all extremely healthy, extremely active. Yeah, we haven't had any issues with any of them. That They just, we try to teach the oldest, especially because she's 10 going on 11. We try to teach her like physical work is okay. We're not, you're not a slave. You're it's okay to do this work and carry buckets and things like that. <laughs> I think at first she was like, oh my gosh, my parents are so cruel. None of my friends have to do this at home. Why am I doing this? But now I'll see her. We have lots of hills and things like that. And I'll see her like timing herself running up the hill with a bucket or something like that. And it, they're just, I couldn't ask for any better health with my children. It's amazing. Yeah, good for you. And because you see so many kids these days are getting sick and in all kinds of way with chronic disease, obesity, diabetes, mental health problems. And I think clearly 100% that has to do with the food environment we raise them in. And so good for you for figuring that out, figuring it out for yourself and then obviously sharing it with your children because it's going to put them at such a huge advantage to some of these other kids that just unfortunately aren't getting good nutrition. And it's a real shame with that. Have you, well, let me see here with the farm. So you got the pigs. Are you doing, how many pigs do you have again? We have three this year. And are you going to write, how you, are you going to, you're going to use those for, I guess, for food at some point? Yeah. Yeah. We, so in the past we've done two each year. And we'll, we take our bacon to be done at a butcher shop. We don't cure our own bacon yet, but we'll do some, some shoulder roasts and things like that. And then a lot of it goes to sausage just because that's an easy go-to for a lot of meals. So. Yeah. It's gotta be, and when you make your own sausage, you know exactly what's in it. Whereas you get these store-bought sausages yeah. where a lot of it is just yeah. pure kind of garbage, to be honest. It's not particularly good. So it's good for you to to know that what is so as far as the, so the dairy you get is that your own dairy for the most part or you said you're going to start doing your own dairy yeah we're going to start probably next year is when we'll be able to do that we actually we yeah you know, i'm not supposed to do this because i'm pregnant but we get raw milk and yogurt and things like that from a local farm it's about a 15 minute drive from here so we We'll go there once a week. The milk's actually cheaper. I don't know how much the milk is where you're at, but in our grocery store, it's about $5 a gallon, give or take a little bit. The raw milk at this farm is three fifty dollars a gallon and has been for the last couple of years now. And so it's cheaper that way. And I found that my, my husband had to buy a gallon of milk the other day from the store because we had people over and we just ran out of milk. So he went and got a pasteurized, homogenized gallon of milk. And I haven't drank but two sips of it and it tastes horrible. So I'm not going to drink any more of it. I'm going to wait until we go back to the farm and get some raw milk. Yeah, I've, I'll have to say the times I have bought in raw milk, it's only been in a store and it's been much more expensive than the pasteurized version for whatever reason. But it sounds like we get it directly from the dairy farmer, then it's going to be a bit cheaper there for sure. Are you sharing any of this stuff on like social media? Are you like, because it might be fascinating for people at homestead and maybe dietary stuff. Yeah, we've, I've tried to, it's really, it's conflicting to me because I want to share a lot of this, but I don't also, I don't enjoy putting all my business out there. So we do have an Instagram page that we entitled the, the Bogert family homestead. But I don't post often and it's just one because we're 
always busy. I don't feel the time the time that it takes to make a post and put it out there and stuff. I could be doing something else. So that's usually what happens. And two, I just don't like sharing all of my business with people. Yeah, fair enough. And let me ask you for because you know every time I hear somebody doing this, it's appealing to me. I don't know about this year, but maybe maybe once I save the world, then I can go. I'm being a little facetious here, but I feel like I have work to do before I could stop back and do that. But how much landing minimum you think you could you need to survive to be independent? Because if you got one acre. Good luck dry, raising a cow on that. I think. And so, what do you think? Yeah. It is a minimum necessary to support yourself where you could be mostly feed yourself. Yeah. If you're going for chickens, you could do it on one acre. You could do broilers and move them every day back and forth. Um, if you had a fairly flat piece of land, as far as sheep, cows, that sort of thing, sheep would prob- probably be easier on a smaller space. I would say give or take probably five acres would be the minimum. And it all, obviously it depends on your family size. If it's just you, then, then yeah, a couple acres isn't bad. They say two acres per head of cow. I would say if you're trying to rotationally graze them and not lean on hay as much, and we don't really feed grain either. So if you're trying to go the grass fed way, I would say five acres. As far as you said, you're thinking you got a 10 year plan. What does that look like for you and why ten, are you thinking you're going to go maybe go to a different property or maybe get a bigger property or what's the, why the 10 year plan? Yeah. Yeah. So initially we wanted this one, like I said, for hunting purposes and just to have a few chickens. Now we're looking at that 10 year plan because we want a little more space, a little bit flatter. So our land is, our house is pretty much in a valley in between these two large hills, one of which I'm staring at right now. And they're steep. It's, there's some parts of it you can't walk up. It's not possible. And it really puts us in a predicament for moving things around. You got to get roads cut out in certain areas so that you can move the sheep, move the cows and everything and get them to certain parts of the land. So I would say if we could find, ideally, everybody wants their 100 acres, right? (laughs) That would be amazing. Right now with the economy, with the housing market, 50 acres would be ideal. 50 acres of probably half and half, half wooded, half grazable pasture. What we're doing here is what's called silvo pasture. So we're not clearing all the trees. We're trying to grow grass underneath the trees, which isn't easy either. So if we could have kind of a 50-50 split where somewhere where we could also grow a little bit of hay in a field maybe, to harvest for the winter times, that would be ideal. And, and you met regenerative. Are you noticing since you've been doing this for a couple of years now, a change in the biodiversity or the wildlife since you started this? And I don't know what the pro- what kind of condition the property was in before, what it was used for. But what have you noticed happened since you've been doing this? Yeah, it's amazing. I wish I would have taken more before and after photos type of thing because. The just the little bit of clearing that we've done, it's it's been truly remarkable to see the change in the grass and the way things are growing. We have a lot of thicker areas that were once crop fields back in probably the 70s that they just let overgrow. And so the brush is really thick and terrible there. And so we're slowly creeping into that type of area. And just little by little, you can tell the grass is growing better. We don't have, we don't have as many predators, which is nice. And it's just, you're able to walk through it and feel comfortable in it rather than feeling like you're getting attacked by the woods, so to say. Yeah, fair enough. Anyway, I'll tell you what, unfortunately, Shannon, we're just about out of time. Remind me the name of your Instagram account. It was the something Bogart family homestead or something like that. Yes. The Bogert family homestead. Like I said, I don't post a ton on there. There's a few pictures up, but yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. And like I said, 
like I said, I think one day I'm going to have me some animals on my property outside of my dogs. And But like I said, I think that's a few years down the road. It's, it's encouraging seeing people, other people doing this. Take care and keep up the good work. And thanks for appearing. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you very much. Have a great day. Okay, folks, we'll see everybody tomorrow. You guys take care. Bye-bye now. Hey, folks, it's Dr. Sean Baker here. If you guys are enjoying these success stories, you can become your own success story. You can do that by heading over to carnivore.diet. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial and get started today. We're looking forward to supporting you. Our community is wonderful, and we'd love to see your success.